All right. All right. Yeehaw. Go. And with that, I thank you for your time. Um, the, the, the good news is we are starting two minutes before the session ends. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Best presentation ever. I, I was waiting for a camera to pop out and say, just kidding. Like, this is all like a conspiracy to not get this talk actually happening. So anyways, um, no, this is great. Thanks for uh, your patience, folks. Um, Uh-oh, is something else broken? Okay. <laughs> Yes. Um, anyways, so while we're still sorting out a couple things, um, just wanted to say how good it is to be back in person uh, for conferences like this. It's great to see people's faces. Remember, like, there are other human beings around. So this is really cool. So I wanted to just thank everyone who made the trip. Um, and are you in person? It's, it's, it's much more meaningful when you can you know, do that. Um, still good? I haven't gone to the next slide yet. Uh, anyway, so my name is PJ Waskevich. Um, I'm actually um, kind of excited and a little terrified to talk about this topic today. Um, there isn't a lot of um, topics that cover high frequency trading that you can find out in the world, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, but this was something that I thought would be important to bring. Um, I work at Jump Trading along with Marshall and Bensa here, and um, I'm pretty excited to talk about like, what exactly uh, happens in high frequency trading and how it relates to networking. Um, some of the challenges that we actually deal with, how we use the kernel, how we don't use the kernel, um, and how do I think uh, we can try and improve that. So I will do my best to uh, keep us at time, but uh, I may fail at that. Yeah. Um, so what are the goals for me uh, for today? Um, when I want to go through this, what, what should you expect to walk out of here with? Uh, first, know what high frequency, high frequency trading actually is. And I see the session actually isn't advancing, is it, on the air meet? Yeah, but the air meet is, it's, it's, it's dead, Jim. Oh, maybe, yeah. Uh, Okay, we've got that. Okay. And this is all. All right, now it looks good. This all is right. all in line with the mystique surrounding high frequency trading. Exactly. You don't no know what's knows. actually happening. So, um, so let's find out what is actually happening in high frequency trading. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit about it. Why is it different? Why is it unique? Um, and to do that um, is really to talk about what I call traditional networking, what a lot of us in this room do, what I used to do in a previous life before coming to Jump, um, and how does that actually um, relate to high-frequency trading. Um, I'm going to have a recurring theme, and this has actually been a recurring theme in a lot of the talks, um, jitter. Jitter is bad, um, and latency in, in general, but really with high-frequency trading, jitter is uh, really the killer. Um, you know, the, the saying with um, online gaming is like, you know, latency kills. Well, jitter in high frequency trading makes you lose a lot of money. So this is a, a really big deal for us. And uh, we'll look at reasons uh, why. Um, so within high frequency trading, we have things on the uh, exchanges, right? So we actually talk to uh, like the NASDAQ, the NYSE, CME, whatever exchange that you're actually um, doing electronic trading with. And those networks and requirements for those networks are uh, one set of problems. Within high frequency trading, typically, and we'll get into this a little bit um, in a bit, uh, we also have high, high performance computing networks. So HPC to do a lot of um, research and quant uh, data crunching. And those network problems are very different. So I will try to touch on both of those. And then along the way, um, try to share some opinions and see if I can get some in-person arguing going. Um, as to what I think we could do a little bit better, um, where things I think in the kernel might actually be able to help us um, not have to build very custom, you know, internally maintained solutions. So what exactly is HFT, high frequency trading? Um, secretive, right? So this is something that uh, I actually have a 
semi-amusing and semi-frustrating time whenever I talk to people and say, what do you guys actually do? Um, this might be in the context of recruiting, like trying to hire someone, and they're like, I have no idea what you do. And actually, Marshall made the comment uh, the other day, went to jumptrading.com, looked at the website, a plethora of information there. Um, and if the, actually, if the Wi-Fi worked and you went there, you would see one page that says where we are office-wise, and that would be about it. So um, that was actually a joke. There, there's really very little out there. Um, and the reason is what high frequency trading firms build, um, everyone knows that they, that they trade, right? They trade stocks, they trade options, they trade um, securities, et cetera, et cetera, with the different exchanges. Um, but it's the how is really the secretive part, is how do the strategies actually work? How do we actually decide what to do and how to execute and then build the things to execute things better than the other high frequency trading firm? Um, so that's kind of like the secret sauce. Um, if you were to go and ask NVIDIA, how did you design your uh, ray tracing in the hardware? Like, how did, how did you actually lay it out in gates? They're not going to tell you that because that's the how. So that's really why you don't find a lot of uh, information about uh, HFT out there. But uh, primarily, if you were to look it up on Wikipedia, it's an algorithmic-based trading. Um, so, you know, we have various ways to analyze data and then make decisions as to whether or not to execute a trade. Um, but, but the trick is that we do it in very, very high volumes. Um, so I read a statistic when I was putting these things together that roughly 60%, 60% of all trades in exchanges in the world are actually done by uh, HFT firms. So if you think about how many trades are actually happening a day in like the NASDAQ, the NYSE, if you see the volumes, 60% of that is actually from us. And it's or not just jump, but other high frequency trading firms. And it's all algorithmic based. So it's actually all firing um, from software and hardware based trading. Um, the trading strategies themselves, the things that actually decide what to do and how to do it um, are rooted, uh, rooted in quantitative research. So we have people that are really good at building models, inference models, and looking at large data sets, looking at them very differently uh, between trading teams and can glean different ways to analyze data, look at signals, and try to predict the future, and then get that strategy in and actually execute it. Um, so I mentioned that the strategies are executed um, depending on the environment, depending on the um, re restrictions on uh, the exchanges, whatnot. Uh, we can either fire things off in software running on an x86 host, or um, HFT firms, it's, it's no secret that they use um, hardware assist, you know, FPGA offloads and other things to help accelerate things. Um, and we also have massive amounts of data to analyze. So on the quant side, if you think about archivals of market data for the last 10 years, so you can look at, you know, trends on various things, I mean, you're in the petabytes of data ranges. So there's a lot of um, restrictions and a lot of pressure on how to move that data around and move it around very efficiently. Um, but really what it comes down to with HFT to make them successful, and you're going to see this, this bullet a lot, is uh, predictable latency is paramount. You know, to kill the jitter off um, is really, really, really key. It's not just about tail latencies. It's about um, predictable latency all the time. Um, if you think about your trading strategy, you have a great trading strategy. You can analyze data. You come up with an idea of what to do in the market, and then you fire that off, and there's some wiggle room or jitter um, your trading strategy might be crap, right? Because it didn't get there when you expected it to. Um, and that can be pretty damaging for the firm. Okay, come on. All right, so if we look a little bit closer at the one side, the exchange side, so what I would call the production side, um, each exchange, if you go out there and look at different um, exchanges like NASDAQ, Eurex, KRX, um, all of them have protocols that they publish uh, if you want to do electronic-based trading. These are specifications with data structures, packet formats, um, how you can actually request information from the exchanges, um, all of that good stuff. And all of them have their own nuances, quirks, you know, rates of packets that can actually go in, rates of packets coming out. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, they all do pretty much run on standard Ethernet. And they're um, typically 10 gig. So when we're talking about market data, again, we're talking about latency. We're talking about predictable latency. We're not talking about moving 
you know, terabytes of data out of an exchange, you know, you're thinking market data, it's all encoded and it's not that big. So um, things like 100 gigabit, it's nowhere really on the radar that I'm aware of for any of the exchanges, 25 gigabit maybe uh, in a few years, um, but pretty much it's 10 gig ethernet um, that, we, that we deal with. Um, but then on the other side of it, when we actually have things that we're analyzing this data coming in, we also need a lot of CPU horsepower. Um, and that's where our HPC environments come into uh, the picture, and that's the grid networks. So large distributed networks of lots and lots and lots of CPU horsepower um, that also you have interconnects. Um, and I'll foreshadow here that, yes, this is where RDMA comes into play in many cases. Um, but again, in these environments, both of them, HPC grid networking, which is all internal, um, and how do we move data around? And then when we're actually interacting with the exchanges, the predictable, predictable latency is still something that is absolutely uh, essential. All right, so now I'm gonna go through and probably breeze through this a little bit because this is stuff that I think most people in this room have already seen many, many times over or actually set up your own um, benchmarking like this. Um, but I, I think we could all agree that just out of the box, if I just set up a workload, um, my kernel stack latency uh, is not that great, right? Compared to what you can get if you do some tuning, you do some um, optimizations, you do some synthetic benchmarking. Um, so things like, you know, very, very uh, typical things like pin the workload to a CPU, right? That's a very common thing to do uh, when you're doing a benchmark. Um, Numa locality, right? This is also something very important that when you're dealing with, um, you know, different network cards plugged into PCI Express slots that are attached upstream to a NUMA node or a you know, CPU socket. If you have to do like a UPI hop or an infinity, infinity fabric hop, that is added latency that you don't really kind of see, right? It's, it's measurable, but it's usually measurable down in the hardware. That's a little bit harder to see. So NUMA, NUMA locality um, is very important. Um, interrupt affinity, right? This is, if you pin a workload onto a CPU, Pin the interrupt um, that would be servicing that queue that services that workload. You know, again, this is not stuff that I, I think is going to be rocket science to anyone here. But something that um, is one step further, usually in the HFT space, is um, we do actually use a lot of CPU isolation. Right? We want to get rid of jitter. So, do I want to have a, a workload pinned to a core? And you'll see later that we don't have the interrupt uh, pinned to the core for kind of obvious reasons but I don't want other things running on that CPU. I don't want the scheduler to come in and screw with me. I don't want other applications to come in and screw with me. So I'll isolate the CPU and pin my workload there and eliminate the jitter completely. Um, but you know, John's uh, keynote yesterday kind of talked about um, benchmarks and when you want to make the benchmark look really, really good, it has to be very synthetic. Um, so if you look at doing all of these things, it is a very, very synthetic benchmark. Um, However, um, so I, I won't read through this. This is just kind of the setup, um, just to show you that there was actually real hardware involved. Um, and I didn't really need anything too powerful. This is what I had laying around at home. So Sandy Bridge, Xeon, um, had a Skylake on the other side. And, um, but the, the key things here is that it is 10 gig and there is a switch involved. So um, there is some extra latency in that part of the network. Um, this is also in the paper if you want to go ahead and um, see more details about how this was uh, put together. But I wanted to f use a really simple test that a lot of people understand, a lot of people know, simple NetPerf TCP RR for a uh, you know, ping pong round robin test, um, which is, is pretty, pretty indicative of how um, like a TCP based network will work like that. So some data, and this is going to be some eye charts, so I apologize, but here's the no optimizations, right? Nothing, nothing changed, um, nothing pinned, nothing anything. I just said netperf run, and um, it wasn't terrible. Um, the average minimum latency was uh, just shy of uh, 52 microseconds. But you can see that the max latency is kind of all over the place. It's a bit of a mess. Um, so this was multiple runs of netperf, try to normalize the data. Um, so we start walking through the different stages of optimization. Um, kind of the different stages of grief. Um, so we pin the CPU. Uh, we don't mess with the interrupt affinity. In this case, I did use a uh, CPU that was on NUMA node zero. Um, this card happened to be plugged into a slot that was also on NUMA node zero. 
Um, I did go back and check after I ran all the data and I was like, hmm, maybe I should go look at that. Uh, but you can see that the, the minimum latency and the average mean latency did drop a little bit, right? So you would expect that to drop, um, but it wasn't a ton. So if we keep going a little bit farther, um, this one is we pin the CPU and we also line up the interrupt. Um, so now we start getting into the cache locality, right? So you have cache hot data, data structures are in place. Um, you should be able to take advantage of that. And you can see that our average mean, uh, minimum latency actually dropped by um, about eight, I think, or seven-ish, somewhere around there. But the mean latency also dropped quite a bit too, which is nice, right? So we're starting to get to this point of like less jitter, uh, which is the important part. So the last part I, I had mentioned um, that we do is the CPU isolation. So we tried that. And now you're gonna see this graph looks a little bit different because, and I have this normalized, um, about half the data sets had uh, minimum or maximum latencies of like four uh, milliseconds. So this chart was horrible. Um, and I was really perturbed by this, <laughs> um, trying to figure out why after isolating that one CPU, I have um, this workload running, um, and the average minimum latency did go up, uh, so did the mean latency. So that's really bad, right? That doesn't, that's not what we would ex expect. So got to thinking, got looking, and then ran one more benchmark. And this was go ahead and rip out um, the interrupt completely, force the driver to be in basically busy pulling mode. Um, so we're, we're now getting into the kernel bypass um, kind of area of life. Uh, made some changes for some busy weight polling up in NetPerf, and lo and behold, uh, we actually got our minimum uh, latency average way down um, by about uh, 12 microseconds from the unoptimized. So not too bad, right? So this is kind of um, highlighting, you know, this is a very synthetic benchmark. This required a very, um, very deliberate way to like mold the system into what I needed to and the application. Right, so is that practical? Um, in the real world, what I'll call traditional networking, that doesn't really pan out. You can't do this per workload if you have other workloads running on a system. Um, inevitably, you will screw one of them up. Um, that's where HFT uh, networks are very different, right? This is actually how we have to run things in production. So the synthetic benchmark, the synthetic, you know, everything is perfectly lined up is actually how things get deployed. Um, so we have CPU isolation, CPU affinity, um, polling, so busy polling, which does, again, imply um, kernel bypass. Um, we also disable CPU power states. Like, that's another thing in benchmarking that people do, which I actually did not do in this, these tests. Um, but it's a sandy bridge. It's kind of stupid. So it just kind of doesn't have as much uh, power state um, diversity as the Skylake. But, We'll disable the CPU power states. And then the one that really makes me kind of laugh um, is that we'll also turn off all the CPU mitigations um, in the kernel, right? So this is one of the really great things about HFT is you own your systems. You have full control over what's on them. You have full control over the workloads. So all of the Spectre um, you know, meltdown, side channel attacks, uh, we can go ahead and boot Linux with mitigations equals off and we get about 25% of our performance back from the CPUs, and that's fantastic. So now to like look at, I don't wanna have this super synthetic, uh, very, very um, deliberately crafted thing. Can I do something with the kernel to actually improve this? So I got to thinking, and maybe AFXDP um, is a possible solution, right? Because if we throw EBPF at any problem, that'll just fix it, right? <laughs> All right, there. To, to be fair, to be fair. Yeah. This, is, this is the denial? Yes, this, this is the denial. Now, this was the making sure everyone was still awake uh, part of it. Okay, so um, what's really compelling about AFXTP and uh, why I think this is, it, it's, it's not here yet. This is um, kind of one of these, like, what, what do I think we can do to improve the stuff in the kernel? Um, kernel bypass without the bypass, I think, is really compelling. Right, and what do I mean by that? So if I have an AFXTP application that in some way is in a busy polling mode, right, it's not running um, with an interrupt, and I'll get to that in a second, if I can identify my hot path traffic, stuff that is very, very latency sensitive, and pass that up to the kernel or up to the user space, 
um, but then allow control traffic, things like LLDP or other control frames get into the stack, that would be really, really fantastic. It's like the best of both worlds as far as I'm concerned. Um, but there are some limitations that I think um, we need to work around uh, or deal with is receive cannot be in Sapphire queue mode. Right? As soon as you fire off an interrupt, you're introducing jitter, you're introducing context switches. Um, now I do know that AFXDP has a busy polling driver outside with full kernel bypass, but see bullet two. Uh, I would really like to see how we, we can get that control traffic into the kernel if we, if we can. Um, and then on transmit, and this is this is um, this may be dated. Someone might have a spirited discussion with me after this. Um, but as far as I understand, it still transmit um, still requires a system call to actually initiate transmits out. Um, and that is another thing that we would like to see um, to reduce the jitter. Uh, so if you think about the the um, the way that trading is working, you know you're firing off signals to the uh, to the exchanges, so you're transmitting. Um, where normally a lot of the networking performance that we try to look at and optimize is on the receive path because that's the hard path. Transmit's usually the easy path. In this case, the transmit is actually the harder path to get the latency down. So, okay. Um, to be fair to networking, um, there's not only networking issues that we have to deal with uh, with high frequency trading. There are other parts of the kernel that also introduce some some challenges. So CPU isolation, um, there are different ways to isolate CPUs, right? You can do it at boot with ISO CPUs. You can do things within SysFS um, when they're online. You can kind of toggle them back and forth. Um, we just go the, the big hard hammer and just isolate CPUs. And they work great until they don't. Um, so there are sources of random IPIs, interprocessor interrupts, that still exist. Um, these are fairly infuriating. <laughs> um, in fact, there was a whole microconference at Plumbers uh, about a month ago that talked about this. Um, so uh, we went there. Um, I talked with those guys about um, this one. And right now, this is not fixed. This is something that I've been uh, trying to get some extra time to, to fix and finish. Um, right now, if you have a certain configuration with SSH and you SSH into a box, a cascade of events happens, and then uh, you get TLB shootdowns uh, issued to every core on, on your system. And obviously that's bad, right? The IPI itself is bad. Um, that introduces jitter. But then also if you're blowing up your, your uh, page references and having to refill the TLBs, that's also going to reintroduce jitter. Um, there was another uh, patch that we actually helped get through with Red Hat um, around this where if you did something like cat proc CPU info, something that a lot of people do, because you know, I want to see how many cores I have, or I want to see my BOGO MIPS. Um, but when you do that, it would query every CPU in the system to see what its current running frequency was. Obviously, that's going to be an IPI. It's going out and asking the CPU, like, hey, what's your state? And you might be running some workload, not expecting to get interrupted. Um, so when you have telemetry running in your environment, trying to figure out what all the frequencies are, and you run that every like two seconds, uh, that adds up really fast. So that's actually been fixed upstream. Um, this is not uh, yet. Okay. How are we doing on time? You can take any minutes. You can... Okay. Okay. All right. So um, I'm just going to shift gears a little bit. So talked about some of the, the higher level stuff on the, on the trading side, the production side. Um, talk a little bit about HPC, uh, because I think this is the, the other half, right, of, of HFT. So I already talked about the exchange interaction. is still Ethernet, right? So at the edge, it has to be Ethernet. So you really can't have a lot of exotic, um, like, network protocols or uh, interconnects uh, on the trading side. But on the HPC side in your grid environment, where you could have, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of CPUs, you have to be a little bit more creative and exotic uh, with your network layout. So um, this is where RDMA has really been, like kind of the niche uh, market for RDMA has been HFT and HPC. Um, so when we have quant research on massive data sets, we're moving this data around. We have massive parallel systems running jobs, uh, and they're dependent on each other to, to finish in a um, predictable way. 
Um, we can't have, you know, like 10,000 CPUs waiting on one because it fired a message and your network ate it, right? That's bad. So again, predictable latency in this case is very paramount. So, you know, RDMA works great, um, but there are things that I think we can do a little bit better. Um, so, and I don't want to steal too much thunder from, from David on his uh, upcoming talk, um, but IOU ring, right? So this is a new, newish um, uh, framework that came from Jens uh, Axbo at uh, Meta. Um, he originally wrote it to replace libAIO, the um, asynchronous IO layer, which if anyone has had the pleasure of working with libAIO, they will know that IO U-Ring is very welcome, even if they don't know anything about it, right? Um, but very interesting things have come up, and David actually had a talk um, at Plumbers, right? Um, so then, then I'll just go, uh, you know, we'll just skip this slide, yeah. Yes, so... Um, there's been actually a couple talks recently. So Jens actually gave an update at Kernel Recipes uh, earlier this year. Um, IO, IOU Ring has really kind of grown beyond, uh, I think, the, the original intent. And that's a very good thing. Um, I mean, even Josh Triplett at Plumbers has a uh, IOU Ring spawn uh, change that actually spawns lightweight threads to speed up build systems. I mean, like, it's not, it's not a storage thing. So it's really cool stuff. Um, and it would be really, really good to see us uh, if there is a way to get to having IOU ring um, map over hardware rings and direct map and transmit down. That might be something that we could look at that's much more kernel standardized that would uh, be able to replace RDMA. So it wouldn't be an RDMA based talk if I didn't talk about Rocky. Um, so we'll talk about Rocky. So RDMA over converged Ethernet, right? So with RDMA still being around right now in HPC, I, I, I do think even if IU U ring or other things emerge uh, quite, a, quite a bit, um, RDMA is still going to be something that's rooted pretty deeply. Um, but, you know, the elephant in the room is InfiniBand is still very niche, right? It's, it's, it's a it, interconnect uh, as opposed to Ethernet. It's really, um, well, it's really expensive, right? That is one thing that um, InfiniBand doesn't have going for it. However, if you're in an HFT space, they don't really care. Um, if it's something that they can spend money on that will make them more money, then that's what they do. Um, so that's really been the thing that has kind of kept InfiniBand going. Um, but the real issue, I think, uh, and from, from my experience uh, within HFT is that the management and uh, administration skill sets, uh, people who actually keep the lights on, keeping your RDMA fabrics um, and InfiniBand fabrics running, um, differ from Ethernet. And so having those types of people with that skill set be able to like get your InfiniBand fabric back up um, is, is kind of dwindling. So, so you basically can't hire them because they don't exist anymore. It's like trying to find a COBOL programmer today, right? <laughs> Which I do know COBOL, but don't tell anyone. Um, so if we look at, um, okay, if we look at uh, Rocky and iWarp, um, these are the other two um, Ethernet-based ones, so RDMA over converged Ethernet or iWarp, which is um, I, or RDMA over TCP. They have their own challenges. We still have converged networks, right? If it's an Ethernet pipe, um, typically the way that these get deployed right now, they're not this dedicated fabric like InfiniBand. Uh, they can have jitter. So often you need to start using things like priority queues and switches or data center bridging to break up the... Um, you know, the flow control uh, and, and drop characteristic stuff. So it's yet one more thing to, um, to deal with. Um, and I actually did have this slide in before yesterday. So, um, so it was very fortuitous that, uh, that, that John gave a really great keynote on HOMA. Um, I do see that as a, a possibility with this new RPC-based approach. Um, I feel like it's kind of similar to RDMA verbs as to how you can actually get data through. Um, but I think having both kernel and user space support is very interesting, right? If I have a kernel driver, then I can kind of get into this part where I might have the access to the kernel stack um, that I wouldn't if I had kernel bypass, but I might get some of that benefit of the, um, of the predictable latencies that um, Home has been advertising. So that, that's pretty compelling to look at. Um, but going back to the, the InfiniBand um, thing about management, if I can get onto standard ethernet switch equipment across my network, that's a big win, right? That, that's a maintenance uh, burden gone. Uh, so that's a really good thing. And if, you know, things like HOMA or, or similar protocols take off and kind of take root in the kernel, uh, more people are going to be writing applications to that. I think writing applications on top of RDMA verbs is a 
also a niche uh, space. So this benefits from people understanding how to write these protocol uh, applications. Okay, and so this is where I throw it out to you guys. Are there others that I'm missing? Are there other possible RDMA replacements? Or is RDMA the right solution? I don't know. Um, but the absolute thing is we must eliminate the jitter, must have uh, the lowest latency possible. If you, if you kill jitter off, but your latency is still like 100 microseconds, you will lose every time in HFT. So you have to have great jitter and also um, lowest latency. So I've been told to get it going. Um, so we have two distinct problem spaces. We have the production trading environments. We have the HPC environments. Um, but uh, predictable latency absolutely is paramount. The thing I didn't mention before is um, there, if you do actually Google for HFT, um, things or DuckDuckGo or whatever your thing is, um, you will find instances that when algorithmic trading goes haywire in the markets, it will actually cause damage to the markets, right? Markets actually, circuit breakers will hit. So if we don't have predictable latency, that can really screw up algorithmic trading. Um, so that is something that uh, that really still is, is like the number one thing that we have to maintain. Uh, and yeah, so that was the, the wrap up. And uh, now this is the terrifying part of the, uh, the, the talk. Well, actually, we're going to do something a little different because we are actually approaching lunchtime. So we're going to take the next talk and do questions together. So just stick yes. around and we'll go with that. And 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 the, now the reason why I'm doing that is you'll see the next talk is actually yeah, starts halfway. Never scheduled this. It's a great job. Incredible. And thank you for people who are no no. We'll we'll do questions together. We, we are out of time, dude. Oh, we are. Oh yeah, okay. Sure. Uh, so surprised that I didn't see Eddie Q in.